Good morning. How's everybody? Awesome. If you could find your seats. Um, were you all enjoying Dr. Dennis Burke yesterday? Yeah, that was awesome. I, was, I didn't get to sit in, so I was listening to it just a few minutes ago, and it was awesome. So anyway, there's still product in the back. Uh, we're we're going to be receiving an offering next hour at the beginning. So be praying this hour about what, what um, you want to sow into his ministry. They do a lot of great things all around the world, him and his wife. Um, they also have a great website I'd encourage you to look up. If you just Google um, Dennis Burke Ministries, you can find his website. So anyway, please welcome back Dr. Dennis Burke. Praise the Lord. Good morning. It is still morning, right? Praise God. I'm glad you're here today. And uh, let me remind you, um, some of you maybe missed it yesterday. I am giving every student, every one of you, one of my books uh, that's on the table, uh, You Can Conquer Life's Conflicts. How many of you got it already? Did you get it already? God bless you. How many of you read it? Any of it. Anything in that book. You read anything in that book. All right. God bless each one of you. And... Uh, <laughs> we found in surveys that reading these things really enhances the impact. So I just encourage you to go ahead and go ahead and read it. Um, but a couple other points of business I'll mention to you, and then I want to jump into some stuff with you. But uh, we do have a, a website, as was mentioned by Daniel, and I encourage you to go there. Uh, we've got lots and lots and lots of materials, uh, various books. We've brought a few things with us here. Um, found out that some of you uh, wanted that book on how to meditate that I ended up writing, that God had me write, and I talked about it yesterday. Uh, they're gone from the table. They're available on the website. They're down, I think it's downloadable, uh, but also we can ship it to you. I'd love for you to have it. Should have brought more. Didn't realize how greedy you guys really are, <laughs> and uh, th that's, I'll, I'll fix that next time, but... Uh, so I encourage you to get that and a number of other things on the table. I'll mention my wife Vicki's book, Some Days You Dance. My wife, uh, she is a great author, much better writer than I am. God bless her. And, um, and God really had her write, uh, um, yeah, there we go, had her write this a few years ago now. Uh, and it really is uh, about a, a point in her life where she she really hit the wall. And uh, issues, uh, been, we'd been in ministry a lot of years and, and uh, obviously saved for a lot longer. And, uh, but she'd hit the wall, and I know I contributed to that, um, and I'm not happy about that. But uh, God had really took her on a journey, helped her apply the things that we had discovered about grace and faith and standing and victory and these things and push through and uh, it really became this book uh, that Victory did. And it's got a discovery guide in it to help people uh, get it. It's for the guys and girls. It's not just for the girls, honestly. It is just one of the most powerful things. So sadly, now that I've said all that, we only have a few copies uh, on the table. But it is downloadable, and we'd love to send it to you if you'd like a hard copy. Um, Kenneth Copeland had a real good, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we've had quite a relationship with the Copelands, and he wanted to feature Vicky's book on uh, TBN at one point when he was hosting, and uh, he introduced it this way, and I thought, oh man, I could not have scripted that better. He, uh, he just simply called it a masterpiece written by the master, and uh, it, it's uh, something I really want to encourage you to get, and it'll bless you, and it'll bless other people uh, that you come to know. Another thing that uh, since I'm talking about my wife, she uh, puts out a daily devotional, and we'd love to send it to you. Doesn't cost you anything. All we need is the email address you want to show up at every day, and, and uh, it's uh, just packed with uh, real faith-building, inspiring stuff from the Word. She's just a great teacher, and uh, so uh, we'd love to send that to you. Uh, yeah, it just takes a couple of minutes to read, depending on your skills. But it's uh, jam-packed full of uh, the anointing and things that will start your day really well and love to send it. So uh, you can sign up for that on our website or just somehow give us an email address you want it to show up at. And we'd love to do that. God bless you, man. I enjoyed my time with you yesterday. I want to jump into a few things today. And I've really had 
um, had a direction the Lord really surprised me with that he wants me to take this morning in our first session. But let me start it with this passage of scripture from, uh, we should start with the Bible, don't you think? It's, it, this is Bible school. Yeah, thanks. Um, I know that wasn't a question. We're not sure what that was. It was an observation or a question. I'm in a weird mood this morning, and it's, it's not altitude related, I don't believe. But I want to read something to you, really, from the book of Luke, the very first chapter. And there, there's something that I want to point out to you and then, then shift in what we're going to talk about in the next few minutes. But the whole Christian experience, this is what you've experienced and I've experienced, it's really about uh, a lot of things, but one of the issues that is always at hand is that we are involved in a transition. We're moving from where we are to where God wants us at all times. We know we're in a place because we've come to know Jesus, but we know that God's got bigger things in mind than what we're experiencing right now. I mean, you know, not only does God have a plan, but there are are parts to the plan you hadn't yet stepped into. Man, we have a future. We have a hope. We've got some exciting days ahead. But those things don't just happen because God wants it. They happen because we embrace it and because we lay hold on it and pick it up. You have to pick up these ideas and these things. And with that in mind, I want to to jump into what an angel of the Lord said to Zacharias, a man that would be father to John the Baptist. And the reason being, there's some very key things that he said about John that are uh, really vital for us right this minute. And it's about this transition and this upgrade. Let me just introduce those two words real strong to you. We're in a day and in a time of transition right now in the body of Christ. We're transitioning into this awakening and new reformation time that I believe will be the most dramatic days of the body of Christ on this planet in all of history. And I think, I think being a part of it at this time, you know, we're made for the 21st century. Thank God that we are in this day. I, I love the fact that we get to benefit from jet airplanes and air conditioning. Now, you don't care about air conditioning much being here, but I live in Texas, man. This is vital to life's existence. <laughs> in my opinion. But we're transitioning into a time where religion that has failed mankind forever is going to have a lot of the covers pulled back to see how empty it is because people everywhere are loving Jesus, but in a lot of cases hating churches. They want to be involved with the real deal. They want something authentic, something real. Something that's deep, something that is meaningful, something that is no baloney. And that's the kind of thing that I feel is vital and not just vital, I believe that is really what this ministry here in this Bible school really exemplifies in one of the best ways I've ever seen. That we are growing in what we discover so that we're finding out how to apply the reality of truth, but do it in a way that that is meaningful and relative. Listen, there's, everybody wants to be relative, man. You don't want to be obsolete. You don't want to be an old fogey. You, you, you want to feel like you're relative. But let me just say this, because I get that and I understand it, but truth is always relative. And if we'll walk in the truth and apply it genuinely to the issues of the day and to the issues of our personal life, then we're going to walk in the truth and that truth is going to be relative, not religious. That's what we're hungry for and after. And that's what we're growing up in so that we're able to impart that to people everywhere that we come in contact with. So let's read from the Bible now that I've said all that stuff. Did you get that? All right, Luke chapter 1. And let's jump in in verse 11. He says this, Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, that's Zacharias, who was standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell on him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you'll call his name John. And you'll have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. 
For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He'll drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Now watch this. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Now watch verse 17. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. And now watch this last line. And to make ready. Everybody say ready. ready. To make ready people prepared. Say prepared. prepared. To make ready people prepared for the Lord. Here was the anointing that was on John. Here's how it was described. This is amazing. Because people had to be ready for Jesus. And Jesus would show up and John's assignment was to make ready people prepared for the Lord. Now look, he was the greatest of prophets. This is what Jesus tells us. He was the greatest of prophets. And there's some great prophets. And he really refers to one right here when he refers to Elijah and the spirit of Elijah being on, the, on John. But here's where this goes for us. And I want to make this leap for you, and then we'll fill in the blanks maybe here in a second. But this is the kind of anointing that is on you and me right now. The kind of anointing that is preparing this planet. Making ready a people. We are that people, and yet... We have an assignment to help people get ready in the kind of way, not just to know Jesus, but to know how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the authority that God's been given or has given to us or, and in the grace that God has provided for us. Man, we have an assignment to grow up in these things, but not only grow up in it, but to pick up the mantle like Elijah carried the spirit and power, you talk about a man that was radical. Elijah was radical. And what God is raising up is people right now that are not just fitting into society, but we are standing out in society. Radical belief is not weird. It's not heretical. It is, it is out there, though, for the religious mind. We believe that we are the children of Almighty God. We believe that we are the sons, daughters of God, born of the Holy Spirit, free from the dominion of sin, authority over devils and demons, designed to live in divine health and to prosper in everything we set our hands to do. That's, that's radical to a lot of people. Now, to a lot of us, that just almost sounds like basic because that's the way, that's the way God wants to shift our thinking so that we're embracing the big picture idea of who we are in Christ and what we're designed to do. Are you with me in this? Yes. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That anointing was on Elijah. And when you look at Elijah's life and you see how it went, it's amazing what happened. But there was a moment that I want to point out to you when Elijah had done what he had done. He had... He showed up, of course, you know, in the very beginning, our introduction to Elijah, he is coming before King Ahab. And, uh, and what does he announce? He says, there'll be no more rain in this land until I say so. And then he turns around and walks away. That's our introduction to this man. It's not a greeting. There's not a, it's just, wow, seriously. And sure enough, just like he said, the entire land went into a terrible time of drought and hardship. Poverty sets in, joblessness, farms aren't growing, crops aren't growing. They're in deep trouble. The whole society is under, under this terrible time. And it wasn't God cursing the land. It was Ahab having cursed the land. It was Israel having followed this wickedness and allowed it in their own lives. And there are consequences to wickedness in a person's life. We can't spare them from that. But we can help them get delivered from it. Glory to God. But you know, I, I, don't, I could spend the whole day on just Elijah. And, uh, and he's worth it. There's plenty for us to get. But the spirit of Elijah was, was out there. He was extreme from a certain point of view. 
And there'll be times that you will be viewed as being extreme. Extremely healed, I like that. <laughs> Extremely blessed, I like that. Extremely peaceful, I think that's a good idea. Extremely victorious, I think that's fine. So call me an extremist, I, I'm okay with that. Religion will never buy into a lot of the things that you have come to discover already. We're not, we're not really trying to appease religious thinking at all. We're not trying to irritate them. I think we do that without trying. It's not our goal. We just don't want, we don't want to become the religious. We don't want to let our faith and our walk with God and these things that we discover become religious for us. And if we've been in religion ourselves, each of us, or allowed that religious thinking to creep in, the Holy Spirit is going to start to help you just identify it much more clearly so that you can set it aside and walk in what real faith and the grace of God is all about. So here's the point I want to make, and then, then I need to shift. There was a point in time, right at the end of Elijah's ministry, he had already found that assistant, Elisha. You know, God told Elijah how he was to complete his tasks God gave him three final assignments. He was to appoint a king, a new king in Israel. He was to appoint a new king. Listen to this. This is so cool considering today's kind of headlines. He was to appoint a king in Syria. <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> okay. You don't seem to enjoy it as much as I do. But uh, <sighs> He was to appoint a king in Syria, and he was to appoint Elisha, to be the prophet of Israel in his stead because Elijah was on his way out. Glory to God. Elijah, Elijah went and found Elisha, obviously knew who he was and had probably had some sort of contacts with him before and the other school of the prophets, those that were there, but Elisha was different. He was a successful farmer. He had, he had a family business he was a part of with his family, long-term kind of situation, and God was pulling him into something totally different. Now, that's, that's good for some, and that's what some are called to. Others are not called to walk away from business and what they have developed. So that's not the point here, but the point is, in his case, Elijah came and threw his mantle at him, you know, that mantle, <laughs> mantle of Elijah, and he threw it at him, and I don't think he said much. He just threw him the mantle. I don't know that Elijah would go over all that well in current, you know, PC kind of environment at all. I don't think he'd fit well in a lot of religious settings either. A lot of churches wouldn't really do well with him. He throws Elisha this mantle, and it was the mantle of discipleship. Now, if I was going to teach on this, we'd spend a lot of time right there. Because Elijah would become someone who would develop and grow into a place as Elijah's assistant, and it was vital that he did this. But then the time would come, and it wasn't all that long that Elijah had Elisha as his assistant. And it was clear that Elijah was leaving, and Elisha was going to step up into this place of authority and leadership as the prophet in Israel. A lot of things had to happen. But Elijah asked Elisha this question, before I leave, what can I do for you? What, what would you like to receive? What an amazing question. And you want to be ready to have the right kind of answer. Because he could have asked for lots of different kinds of things. But what he said is extremely powerful but all of these things are also metaphors for us in understanding what Jesus has done and where we stand, and I want you to see it with that in mind. He answered the question, though, this way. He said, I would have a double portion of what's on you. A double portion. This, let me work on that with you for just a minute because I know the facts are clear that Elisha experienced, and we have record of double the miracles. But he wasn't asking to do twice as much. It wasn't a competitive thing. 
I want to do twice as much as you've ever done. You know, that just, something wrong with that idea, I think, you know. I mean, it's uh, it, nothing. I guess it's okay. You want, to, you want to be fruitful. But I don't believe that's what was in his heart at all. Because what he asked for was the portion that comes to a firstborn son. In that society, a firstborn son received double of what anybody else received. There was reasons for that. It was a double portion. It was the portion of the firstborn son. That's what he wanted to receive. He wanted to receive and be to Elijah just like a firstborn son regarding spiritual things. He didn't want all of the outer trappings, which in Elijah's case, it doesn't look like was very much. He wanted what made this old man tick, to tick on the inside of him as a young man. I want what you've got. I want to walk in this kind of life. I want to see the kind of power that you've walked in. That's what flips our switch. That's what we learn to taste right from the beginning. That's what you're getting in this school, man. You get to taste the anointing that you've been designed to walk in. But something had to happen. Elijah said this. He said, you've asked a hard thing. Why would it have been hard? Because it wasn't up to Elijah whether this would actually happen. It would be up to Elisha. He said, if you see me when I go up, Meaning if you're in the right place, meaning if you're paying attention, meaning if you don't run off, if you don't get offended, if you don't leave, if you don't do what others do, if you don't get distracted, if you don't take a detour, it can have all kinds of meaning to it. But if you see me when I go up, yeah, then you'll have it. If you don't, you won't. Elijah couldn't control that. Elisha did. These are the pictures we have to understand about the blessing of God in our own lives and the callings of God and the way we'll walk in these things. But you know what happened? One long, here came the chariot. Dear Lord, I am going to ride in that chariot. I don't even know what this thing really looks like exactly, but I know this, this sucker got to be fast. <laughs> and something right about riding in that in my opinion. And if the line is long to ride in it, of course I feel I'll be ahead of you because I brought it up first. But, uh, <laughs> but if the line is long, we do have eternity. Time's not an issue, so it's a whole different system. It doesn't matter. Anyway, so you know what happened though? Here came the chariot. Elijah went up in the chariot. There was Elisha. And what did he say? My father, my father. It's the very thing he had cried out for. I want to I want to be like your son. I want to receive that double portion. And he said it. I see it. My father, I'm seeing it. He knew it was his. Then here came, here came that garment, that cloak, that mantle. But it's more than a cloak. It really represented also the anointing that that old man had walked in and Elisha went over and picked it up. Ladies and gentlemen, this is absolutely significant. To where you sit right now because what we're doing in this day is we are picking up the mantle Jesus went up when he went up the mantle came down he told those 500 people that saw it he told them to go tarry in Jerusalem and wait it would be 10 days that they would have to wait there was 500 of them according to scripture but what we also know is that after those 10 days passed, by the time the day of Pentecost really had come, there was only 120 up there in the upper room. What happened to 380 people? They saw Jesus go up, but they didn't pick up the mantle. They weren't in the place that they were told to be. They had gotten distracted. They had gotten discouraged. They had gotten detoured. Whatever it was, we don't know. Now, that doesn't mean they were out forever, but they weren't in the upper room when the, when the Holy Spirit came. I don't want to be like the 380. Man, we're like the 120. The mantle has fallen. Jesus went up. His mantle came in, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we've chosen to pick up that mantle and not be distracted, not be detoured, not be discouraged, even by the events of life and the 
discouraging times that you can read about every day in the paper or listen to on any news channel. Man, there's discouraging stuff going on all around us. But don't let that paint the picture of what's really going on in this planet. Man, revival is everywhere. There's outpourings everywhere. We are in that day. We are in the day of a new Jesus revolution. Oh, yes, we are. We are in days of awakening and days of reformation are upon us, man. These are big words and big concepts, but it brings me to what really God wanted me to focus on by setting the stage as I did just now. Because of the days that we're in, it was a few years ago, the Holy Spirit really, really tagged me to start talking about something. He showed me something just in relationship to my own experience. And so I'm going to take a little time. I don't do this very often, but I, I feel compelled to share some stuff with you. And I refer to it yesterday and from time to time, bits and pieces, but the late 60s was a crazy time here in America and really a lot of trouble all over the world. But from our frame of reference and my personal frame of reference, growing up in Southern California as a kid, in a, in a somewhat dysfunctional household, somewhat, <laughs> that's an understatement, I guess, but, you know, every household has varying degrees of dysfunction, so, you know, it's just a handy word to say, you know, we're just all in a mess, but uh, but in the 60s, there was a lot of trouble going on, not only on a personal level, but here in America on a national level. And I know other troubles were happening elsewhere in the world, but our frame of reference, my frame of reference at that time, just as a young guy, we saw our nation being torn apart. We saw a crazy war going on in Southeast Asia. And it had been escalating. We saw the, the trouble that was in the streets pushing back on this war that was taking place. We saw the drug crazed young people going off the rails. I was one of those. Just going off the rails. No guidance, no sense of direction, no real connection with the future, no real knowing of what needed to happen. It was just live for the, for the day. And for me, it just became a life of, even though I was just a young guy, but it just turned into my goal was just to get stoned and listen to rock and roll and hang with people. I really didn't have a great deal of direction. I had tagged into photography as what could be a career for me, and I thought I would become a photographer and felt there was a little bit of direction in that. But for the most part, I just really didn't have a great deal of direction at all. And though I was in a very basically, you know, nuclear kind of fine you know, middle America family. Man, we didn't suffer at home. We didn't, I, I don't have a, we were all broke and not ever eating type story. But you know, trouble is trouble. Sin is sin. Enemy's an enemy. And these were crazy times. And the reason the, the Holy Spirit pointed this out to me just a couple of years ago is because I began to recognize that we're living in somewhat of a mirror right now of those days in the late 60s. And I know for a lot of you that sounds like it would be two lifetimes ago. Actually, it's one. And it's, it's just way back ancient history, but there are things about history and really my own history and many of yours also from those days that really are recycling and happening all over again. And, and the strategies remain the same even though the details are different. In those days it was the war in Vietnam. In these days, it's in the Middle East. In those days, it was a hippie movement and a pushback on, on uh, war and establishment. In these days, it's gotten far more violent and it's turned into some of the craziest anarchy in the streets. And you and me as believers, we have to wake up to the days that we're in so that we are recognizing our role in this time. In those days, 
1967 became a, a pretty significant year. It was a, a year when we had in America here our own troops amassing in the Mekong Delta region of Vietnam and along the border of Cambodia. We had soldiers going into, into battle, airmen, every different branch going into battle, and many of them coming back a wreck if they came back at all. Not all of them did, I get that, but a lot of them, some of my friends came back uh, in a lot of trouble, and some of them didn't last very long. Others didn't make it back from that, from that battlefield. It was a tragic time. Sadly, in America, we didn't really know how to treat these people, and they came back really treated poorly. Some have lived their entire life, even to this day, as veterans who have lived under the, under the terror and issues that came from that battle in the way they were treated in coming home. Thank God at least we've learned a few things in America to not let that happen again. But 1967 was also a year that was quite pivotal in a lot of ways. We were still recovering from the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Rioting in the streets, racial tension had just gone ballistic. A couple of years earlier, 1965, there were terrible, terrible racial riots that were going on. It would just be a year later in 1968 that the great Martin Luther King was assassinated. These were real troubling times. But something also began to happen in 1967 that really rocked the world in a lot of ways, rocked my world in a big way, because it was in 1967 that the Jesus Revolution actually began. It began very small, and you wouldn't have known it really at the time. You got to look back to realize what was going on, but in three places, almost simultaneously, this began to emerge. Some people began to get together, some ex-druggies and hippie types and fringe people in society, some in Seattle, some in San Francisco, and some in the South Bay area of Los Angeles and Redondo Beach, not far from where I was. And it was young people that began to have an experience in God. They began to have a reality. They had become completely disenchanted with society and with family and with the American dream, two cars in the driveway and a chicken in every pot. Give me a break. There was a lot more to life than that. And they were looking for what it was. They were looking for real love. They were looking for real peace. And they looked in all the wrong places to find it. 1967, these things began. And in one place in Redondo Beach, California, there was a little church called Bethel Tabernacle, pastored by Lionel Stenis, who's been in heaven now a long time, but Lionel Stenis became a real catalyst for a lot of things. Didn't know it at the time, really. For him, it began as a cry of his own heart. He pastored a little church, Bethel Tabernacle, there in Redondo. He'd been pastoring it for some time. Full gospel sort of church. But nothing really happening in his church, nothing significant going on. But when he had drive the streets around his city in Redondo Beach, down by the beach and even other places, there were a lot of young people had been coming out to the West Coast. And this had been going on elsewhere. I'm just giving you the frame of reference that I had. But they began to come to the West Coast looking for whatever they were looking for and finding nothing but trouble. They were living in the streets. They were getting on drugs. There was a huge problem in Redondo Beach and neighboring beaches. A lot of kids in the streets, long hair druggies, hustling, prostituting, doing whatever they could do to survive, living in bushes, living on benches, dirty, dirty feet, no shoes, a lot of trouble. And Stenis began to see this going on in his city. He began to cry out, God, there's got to be an answer here. And it began to get big inside of him. There has to be an answer. He was calling on God. He really didn't know what that answer was going to look like. You know, a lot of times that's how it goes, isn't it, man? 
something gets on you, you, you begin to call out to God, you don't know what it's going to look like, but you've come to discover that the very fact that God has put something inside you to, to reach out to God to obtain is an indicator many times that you're going to be a part of the answer. Not just seeing the problem, but pushing for solutions. Pastor Stenis was in his church one Sunday morning, and he was preaching a typical message like he always would, and before he actually he got up to preach, here came a young man walking into the church, and he made his way up toward the front, sat down to listen. He was a strung out guy, dirty hair, hadn't bathed probably in a few days, barefoot, heroin addict. And he came into this church and sat down and listened to Pastor Stenis' message. That day, Breck Stevens gave his life to Jesus. Pastor Stenis just said, who wants this? Breck made it known he wanted whatever it was. He was the only one. Others had been going to that church a long time. Nobody knew other than him had come to that service. Pastor Stenis came off the platform and came down to the front. Just a, It was a small church. It didn't take long. And he took Breck by the hand and he led him to Jesus. And then he broke the power of drugs off of his life. He took authority over demonic oppression and demon powers that had plagued this young man. And got Breck Stevens baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. All right now, right at the altar, real power. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. <laughs> Woo! Man, that's the real deal. Breck had just stepped into something he didn't even imagine. Didn't even know really what to think necessarily, but he knew he was free. He asked the pastor, he said, are you guys going to meet like this again sometime? <laughs> yeah, it's, he may not have known exactly where he was. Pastor told him exactly when the next service would be. It might have been that evening, I don't know, but whenever it was. Breck said, that's fine, good. He said, I've got some friends, and they need the very thing that just happened to me. Well, whenever that next service came, here came Breck with eight friends. They had all piled into the same car apparently. Nobody knows maybe where that car came from or whose it was, but here they came. Every one of them strung out, long hair, in the same situation as Breck. Seven of those eight gave their life to Jesus that night. Pastor Stenis broke the power of that addiction that was on them, cast the devil out of every one of them, got them baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. Glory to God. Every one of them felt just like Breck now. They all had friends, enemies, and clients. And they started to invite these people to come to this church. This place started to load up with young people. There was more hair in that church than you can imagine. <laughs> hair was a big deal in those days. I mean, it's still a big deal. Like I say, you know, you want it to... Turn gray, don't turn loose. I mean, hang on. Well, this place began to grow. Now, something happened. There, there were others that were in that church that had been going to this church a long time, and one of them uh, wanted to talk to the pastor. After a period of time, a few months had gone by, and the church was loading up with young people. The whole culture of this church seemed to be changing. And these people had been going to this church a long time. They had... They had some feelings about what was going on here. And they had gotten together. And one of the men, the chief fossil among them, <laughs> made an appointment with the pastor. I call them fossils. That's not just an age thing. A fossil is something where there was life, but there's no detectable life now seemed like these people probably qualified for that so I just affectionately and clearly and I know you know what sounds offensively call them fossils but I'm not here to be PC I really don't care what you think <laughs> they were dead something alive is happening there's going to be a conflict so the chief fossil wanted to meet with the pastor he said pastor we fossils have been talking <laughs> he didn't say that he didn't say that But they had been talking, and he said, look, you know, we love our church. We've been with you a long time, and we love, what's, we, we, we love 
uh, what we've had here, but it's changing. We've put money into the carpets and made the, the building nice, and these young people are coming, and they're dirty, and they're, they got no money. They're, they, they can't contribute anything. And uh, we've just decided, Pastor, that either they go or we go. And you got to do something. Well, you know, Stenis has been put in an awkward position, obviously. He's looking at the guy that represents maybe the only legal money that's being made by anybody attending his church right now. <laughs> and whether we like it or not, there is a business side to all of it. Finances are involved, and so no doubt he had to at least ponder it for a moment. I guess he did. But he did reply to this man. He said, well, look, he said, you know, look what God's doing to these young people. This is what we've been praying, that God would send and do something and help these young people in our city. And look what he's doing. He's bringing these young people. Here they come. It's not our job to clean them up. God will clean them up. You watch. They'll clean up. They'll get jobs. They'll become uh, a part of society. They'll have offerings. They'll contribute. And he said, I want you to know, and I, he said, I want you to tell all of those that got together, I'm really going to miss you guys around here. Amen. And he turned around, walked away, left the conversation. The pastor did. Amen. Glory to God. Well, you know what happened. God jammed that place out with young people. It was 1971 before Vicki and I gave our hearts to the Lord during this Jesus movement. And while we didn't make Bethel Tabernacle our home, we liked going down there. They had church every night. Yep. Seven, night seven nights a week, man. They had church every single day. And so the church we plugged in at, if there wasn't something happening there, we wanted something, we'd go over to Bethel. They'd sing, they'd dance, they'd tambourines. And you look back and they were just simple choruses that they were singing, but it was all about Jesus, man. It was just all about Jesus. Glory to God. Oh, yeah, there was some strange things happened. I know. You see, weird didn't bother me. I'd been traveling the universe earlier. So uh, <laughs> weird stuff happened here. You're not going to scare me off. <laughs> and there was a few weird things, sure. One service, Breck had just started talking. And, and uh, Breck had now, by the time we got there, he's preaching some of the messages. They had sung a few songs and Breck was saying a few words and suddenly I was sitting, Vic and I were a little closer to the back and somebody, somebody opened the side door in the back, just slung it open from the outside. Here's a guy, his hair's out to here, his eyes are like this, he's probably been on speed for a week and he started to cuss the whole church. <laughs> Screaming it out, man, just laying, laying out to the church and... and uh, so everybody just started singing louder. <laughs> now I couldn't help, you know, and people are praying in tongues, you know, you know what's going on. But the, the church had ushers. The, the main entrance was in the back, and they had ushers. I think maybe at other times they worked as bouncers. These were big ushers, <laughs> real big ushers. There was two of them. And I did notice that once that door opened in this... Uh, this uh, language began to filter through. The ushers disappeared. And in a moment, I noticed looking at the side door, our friend disappeared. <laughs> ushers got him. <laughs> in a little bit, you know, I couldn't help it. You know, I'm a curious young guy, man. I looked around, and here was our friend seated in the back with the ushers helping them, <laughs> one on each side. Amen. Glory to God. He sat through the rest of that service because he had to. <laughs> well, the culture at, at Bethel at that point was that at the uh, end of the service, if this was your church, if, this was a, if you were here, uh, you come spend an hour down at the altar praying in tongues. Amen. Everybody. Amen. So we're going to be dismissed. A few people leave. Most people came down to the front. 
well, this wasn't our home church, but we love Bethel, man. We'd go down and we'd get down there and we're praying in tongues with everybody else, praising God. It's loud. It's crazy. And, but, you know, our friend, I was real curious how this was going to go. Well, the ushers, you know, some people need help to do the right thing. So uh, <laughs> the ushers helped him to the altar, helped him down the aisle. I think he left black heel marks behind him all the way, but he came down to the altar. Now I'm praying in tongues, but the Bible says watch and pray. And uh, so I felt, I felt biblical. I was watching. The ushers got him down to the altar area, packed with people of, laid out, crying out in tongues, praising God. And here came the ushers and our friend. And so they wanted to help minister to him by helping him to his knees. <laughs> well, they're big ushers, and so they just began to help him make his way down. And this guy was resisting with all he had, but he didn't have enough. <laughs> and just as he hit one knee to the ground, he threw his hands up and cried out, Jesus, help me. <laughs> oh, Jesus got him. <laughs> Ushers didn't have to hold him anymore. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> These were powerful days. Now, look, I know, you know, there'll be lawsuits flying and somebody protesting how you're violating somebody's rights or who knows what kind of goofball thing would come up today. What I want you to see, though, is that there is a place for you and me as believers. There is something happening. It began to emerge out of that Jesus movement where there was a passion, man. Vicki and I, when we came in, we, we didn't know anything about anything, really, but we had... We knew we were delivered and we knew we'd come out of that drug scene and we knew there was a new priority in our life and that Jesus was the real deal. We didn't know a lot, but we knew that what we had would happen for somebody else. And while we had a lot of friends that were in still stoners and having their problems and wasn't just our friends, a lot of people around us. And I know that's not everything that was going on in these days. I'm just telling you, this was my experience in my world. We were the, we were the Jesus freaks. Amen. We were the outsiders. And it's not like we fit into churches when we went to look. I mentioned to you yesterday, but I looked for a church, didn't really fit in. Until I found one, one Saturday I was passing a church and a guy was in the flower bed planting flowers. So I went up and introduced myself. I said, my name's Dennis Burke. Can you tell me about this church? I'd already been to some that made it clear I wasn't welcome back. Not everybody wanted my kind. And I get that. You look kind of rough and uh, not rough. I didn't look threatening. I always, hadn't always been the big hulk of a guy I am today, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. You see, you weren't really supposed to laugh on that. He said, yeah, I'll tell you about the church. He said, I've got to go to the nursery and get some more flowers, man. Let me, why don't you come with me? And I'll tell you about the church on the way. Well, I said, fine. I got in the truck. He headed off. He's driving, you know, and he starts talking. I don't know what he's talking about. I had no idea what, it, it wasn't really about the church. It was about, you know, uh, Holy Ghost. What? What's? that i mean i didn't know i didn't know anything about any of this the only ghost i knew anything about was casper the friendly ghost he wasn't talking about casper he went on and on man and i remember we we're driving along you know i'm looking at him and it's just flooding out of this guy i don't know what he's saying but i remember thinking i'm looking at him man it's just poured out of me so alive in jesus you know and i just remember looking at him and in my head i'm saying wow you know, vocabulary was kind of, kind of slim in those days. I went, wow, that, that covered so much ground, you know. So I said, wow, this is far out. 
And it was. He invited me to come to church. I came to church that next Sunday. He was the door greeter. His name was Ed Dufresne. And I know you. You want to take a break now. So I'll pick it up after the break.
All right, good morning. Have you enjoyed the ministry of Dr. Burke? Hallelujah. We only bring the best. And uh, praise God. And so right now we want to receive an offering and so into Dr. Burke's ministry. And so remember, we just have, raise your hand if you want an offer, offering envelope, and we'll get those to you. Get your, keep your hands raised. And uh, you spell thousand, T-H-O-U. Yeah. Um, please make sure you get back to the, to the uh, back table, and we, we don't want him to have to take anything with him. And, and I think he has a, a free book back there, hopefully. Praise the Lord. So keep your hands raised. You can write checks out to Karis Bible College. Galatians 6.6 6 says, let him who has taught the word. Raise your hand if you've been taught the word. Well, let's probably put it back down because that's kind of confusing because your hands are raised for the offering envelope. So let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. And so let's do that this morning. Ask the Holy Spirit, what do you want me to sow? It's a good ground. It's good ground. Amen. All right, so let's pray over the offering, and then we'll invite Dr. Burke up. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Father, for sending uh, Dr. Burke to us, Lord. I thank you for quality minister of the Word of God, and I thank you for the things that have been sown on good ground, Father, here. And, Father, we have the opportunity to sow back onto good ground in his ministry, Father. And so, Father, I thank you that we sow in faith and we sow in love in, in, back into his ministry, Father, and we just thank you, Father, that you seal it into your kingdom, that it's used uh, to spread the word of God and salvation wherever Dr. Burke goes, Lord, and we just thank you, Father, it works for him and his ministry, but it also works for us, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, you give back into our bosom so that we can give again. So thank we thank you, Father, that this is sealed into your kingdom and is holy and blessed, and your blessing comes over all of our finances in the name of Jesus. And everybody in agreement with that? Amen. Amen. You can receive the offering. And so Dr. Burke, come bless us some more. Glory to Jesus. I want to thank each one of you that's so into the ministry and thank this ministry for believing also in what God's called me to do, to be able to share it with you. And I believe your seed is just as we prayed, that it is blessed and that it's increasing and it's multiplying in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. So you're blessed and I appreciate you being a part of this offering this way. Glory to God. Well, I've gone into way more detail than I really intended today, but I'm not going to take any of it back because I don't want to leave me in the truck or at just showing up at the church where I had met Ed Dufresne. Ed Dufresne went on to later on have a very powerful ministry all over the world, and uh, he and I stayed in contact for a long time, and, and uh, he's in heaven now just enjoying those things he preached about, but he had a a marked influence in helping Vicki and me really connect to the Copeland's ministry. Ed went and found all of Brother Copeland's tapes, actually ordered them, went to a conference, and next thing you know, we're borrowing them because I didn't have the money to buy them. And uh, we just grew from there, and it was just a tremendous time. We plugged into this church, having come out of that drug life. And when I met Ed and first got in that truck and went to that service for the first time, I, was, I wasn't a church-looking guy. I wasn't a church-going person. And I uh, still had that kind of raw look for me, but, you know, but my regular, you know, dress was just T-shirt, jeans, and some funky-looking shoes. And if I was going to dress up, I put on socks. And so <laughs> when I went to church that day, I did have socks on also. But... Um, so you understand you, why some people don't always look at you like you really belong there. But this was a church, while it was all church-looking folks, I mean, they just looked like church folks. Uh, nobody hassled me. I felt I had found a home. I felt I was welcome. And, of course, I met Ed right at the door. He shook my hand and shook actually my arm and actually shook my whole body just to, you know, <laughs> welcome me to church and... I was so thrilled I had found some place I knew was a home. And it was in that church that I began to grow in the things of God. It was that church where I met 
my darling wife, she came just a few weeks later. She'd gotten saved earlier than me up in Seattle with some of the Jesus freaks in Seattle and uh, got off of the drug scene and now was looking for a place and came into this church a few months after I got there. And, and uh, uh, when I saw her walk in, we were in sort of a, it, the church was sort of an octagon kind of shape and I was on one side and you can see the front door. The pastor was preaching, she, she came in or something was going on, but I don't remember anything other than her walking in after that uh, regarding that service. That's all I remember. And I just plotted and planned on what I could do to meet this girl. And I know it doesn't sound all that spiritual, but, and it wasn't. <laughs> Before long, I've realized she, and found out she liked motorcycles. Well, I, I had a little Harley Davidson I'd been riding for a good while already. And, and so uh, I, I came to church on my Harley after that. Uh, <laughs> After every service, care for, would you like to go for a ride? If, oh, yeah, her dad had had motorcycles, so, so I'd get her on the back of my Harley, and not far, we weren't terribly far from beach areas, and there was this nice ride, real, a lot of twisties, you know. And uh, the cool thing on the twisties is, you know, they, uh, they hold on tighter. <laughs> and so that's the goal, you know. And, so she really enjoyed the bike. She actually liked the bike. I found out way later, you know, a little better than she really liked me. But, you know, you just go with what works. And, and uh, so thankfully we've been married over 44 years now and, and uh, love her. She's a wonderful woman of God and uh, my Alpha and Omega wife, first and last. Glory to God. We plugged into some things in this Jesus movement. We began to realize that we were really being caught up in it. We both come off of this drug scene. I'd, I'd, I shared last night a little bit about that and how this really shifted for me. And I want to take a moment just to do that uh, because it was so significant. And I think it'll be encouraging to some people over maybe things that you're facing even now. Because backing up a little bit when I'm just a young guy still on the drugs. My, I had something happen in 1967 back to that time frame. I'm 13 years old. I'm already smoking dope and running with the wrong crowd. And, and, uh, and it, at 13, my, my dad committed suicide. Well, that didn't, that didn't help my cause and it just sent me further down the rabbit hole really. And, uh, and I didn't blame him for my issue. I mean, this was my issue. He had his issues, I had mine. But, you know, that's just where, where you're at, where you find yourself. And so for me, from that point forward, it was really just the drugs and, and rock music. And, and I was way too far into rock music. But um, my dad had told me something, though. I was 12 years old. He had told me something that at the time, you know, it didn't really have a lot of meaning to me. I didn't really think it sunk in all that deep. He told me at 12, he said, don't start smoking pot. I don't know if he already realized I was or got, you know, got to thinking or, or what, but he just said, don't start. He said, you start that, it leads to other things. You'll end up on heroin. You'll be at a party some night. Somebody will bring heroin. You'll take it and you'll end up as a junkie and it'll wreck your life. Well, you know, at 12 years old, you've had, you know, early adolescence there's all adolescents go through this nearly there is what we now know is the impartation of total knowledge <laughs> that arrives at early adolescence you know everything about everything you need to be told nothing dad you don't need to tell me this yeah I know yeah 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 you know you just blow it off now granted this was also my rebellion and dysfunction and demonized life coming out but you know I really didn't pay a lot of attention to it but now years pass, and I'm off into this drug deal. The one thing I would never do was heroin. Now I realize, looking back, of course, it was from that conversation. That was the only line I had. I had no other line. If it burned, I smoked it. If you could drop it, I would. If it came in capsule, paper, mushroom, it didn't matter. 
It was cra you're crazy. I mean, it's just ludicrous. And I think about it now, and you just send shivers down your spine. Well, that's, you know, you're just an idiot. That's what you do. But I, uh, I went to that party that my dad talked about. And when I went to this party, some people showed up. Some of the, some of the stoners shows up with uh, some heroin. I didn't even know what it was. They didn't say what it was. And you're so stupid, you don't even ask. Anyway, you don't care. But that's just the way it was. And that's the way it is now for a lot of people, still. And so sure enough, you know, I take care of one with the, at the party, just like my dad said. And when I woke up in the morning at, at home, I partied that night and whatever. I, I really don't know at this moment, you know, what else went on. It doesn't matter. But I remember this, this is what happened in the morning when I woke up. I had two thoughts hit my head almost simultaneously. The very first thought when I opened my eyes is I want to do that again. And I want to do it right now. That's how powerful it was. And the second thought though, almost like in the same line of thought, the same breath, so to speak, I heard my dad. Tell me what he told me. And I knew that I was, I was on wrong territory, man. I'm going the wrong way. When I look back, I realize that God actually used that conversation. Though my dad was in all the mental state that he was in, and I was as distant as I was, God used that conversation to grab me. Now, years after it happened. And laying in bed, it rocked me. It shook me what had been said to me and what I had done. And the, the fear of it just grabbed me. And I made a decision then, still laying in bed, I am not going that way. I got to find out about Jesus. I mean, that's, that's where my head went. And, I, and this Jesus that's, that's around me. Now, Christians hadn't really talked to me about the Lord at all. You know, Christians oftentimes, they don't really care if you go to hell. As long as you don't interrupt whatever the heck it is they're doing. Don't get me started on that. But I didn't care what any of them thought or said. I hadn't cared about what people thought or said for a while anyway. And that's when I went on this quest to find a church. But I got together with, with my, my good friend at that time, another stoner. We, we traveled the universe together. We'd go chase girls and, and uh, go to parties and do all this stuff. His name was Dennis also. And Dennis and I, we'd get together. And we, we had a little entrepreneurship thing going also, you know, on the side with all this. And, and uh, so yeah, I try to be kind and just... <laughs> You know, I don't know why I'm telling you all these deep secrets of my life. You know. Now, these are things the Holy Spirit just has tagged me, said that he wanted me to talk about. I don't really talk about it that much. Because it was dark stuff. I mean, I make light of it and, and all that, but this is dark stuff. But I told Dennis, I said, we got together and, and we'd have our stuff and what we needed to have and what we were going to, you know, work with. And, all and uh, I said, Dennis, here's the deal. I said, we got we to gotta stop this, man. We got to go after Jesus. I just told him, I mean, straight up, man, I, I don't even know Jesus right now. But, man, we got to go after this. we got to find out what, what's going on here. And we gotta, we got to come off of this stuff. And Dennis, you know, this was, you know, this was classic Dennis. Yeah, man. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, far out. <laughs> you know, but even with limited vocabulary, like both of us had, we were, we were communicating very deep things. This was <laughs> extremely powerful. And so, so I said, so we're not going to buy anything new. We're buying no more stuff. We, we're going after Jesus. Now, we'll use what we have. <laughs> I know, it's so pathetic. It is. You know, you look at it, it's so pathetic. But, you know, this was like a major decision here, man. It was like, wow. <laughs> and, and Dennis, you know, of course, you know, oh, yeah. yeah what the, oh, right. Well, a couple of weeks passed, you know, because we did have a fair amount. And, 
<laughs> I know. And uh, Dennis shows up, though, one, one, before we were headed out, he shows up, we're checking. I said, wait a minute. What is this? You didn't have this before. We didn't. Where'd this come from? He said, oh, oh, but Dennis, he said, this is, this is from Columbia, and this is, you got to try this stuff. This is amazing. I said, wait a minute. We agreed to something. We're not going to buy anything more. And here you've gone and bought this. And as pathetic as all this is, really, I, I understand, but something went off in me again. And I'm done. I'm done with all this. I'm done with what we're doing. And you can go on to do whatever you're going to do, but I'm done. And I was done. I walked away from every friend, because all my friends were, you know, <laughs> wrong. And I, I walked away from it, all of that, but I wanted to pursue Jesus, and I went after it. Now, fast forward a little bit, I found, I found Ed, I found this church. We started to grow in the things of God, Vicki and I did. We started, we'd go down to Bethel Tabernacle, I mean, they had church every night. We plugged into that church that Ed had, was a deacon at, and this church was they, were, they, caught the, they caught hold of the vision that God's doing stuff among young people. I mean, I was the first, you know, freak to come to the church, but they didn't run us off. We just started coming to the church, and they embraced it. The pastor caught the vision of it and wanted to see it grow. Part of what I'm saying to you is this, and I know this is a lot of my own story, and everybody in this, we've all got stories. We all have them, and they're all valuable. But what we have to recognize is that nobody can steal our story from us. Nobody can talk us out of it. The devil cannot change it. We have beat the devil, every one of us. We've come out of his grip. Whatever that grip was, we're held by the grip of grace. That's what the Bible tells us. We'll read it here if I ever get to the Bible. Have we read from the Bible today? I really want to in Bible school. All right. But we have an assignment to now pick up this mantle. That's what was happening for me. I was beginning to pick up that mantle of who I was. It's discovery, man. It's finding out who you are. It's finding out the reality of truth. And that truth is always relevant. Now, I know I said that earlier, and I, I said it wrong three times. It is always relative, but it's always relevant. It's relevant to today, and it's relevant to every person's issue. It's relevant to this generation. It's relevant to every generation. You see, you got to realize that once we're in Christ, we are all one house, one family, literally one generation. And while naturally we all have our differences, we cannot fall for the trick of the devil to amplify the differences and allow those differences to become divisive. And that's really the trick the enemy had tried to play on all of us in this hippie thing and an anti-establishment. But the same spirit remains. It's in racism. It's in genera generational differences. It's in denominationalism. It's in religion everywhere. It's all about division. It's all about what you have that I don't, what I have that you don't, and what I don't like about it. And we've got to be, we've got to be bigger than this because you and me, it doesn't matter what our background is, it doesn't matter whether you were stoners or you were hated stoners, if you were military or not military, while all that counts on a lot of levels, don't get me wrong and take this wrong, but when it comes to the context of what we're here for today and what our assignment is, we are one house, we're one family, we're one body, we're one with Christ. We are the church of the firstborn. We are elevated into the place that God had on his mind from the beginning for every person that we would live spirit, soul, and body glorifying God and seeing the power of God in our life. We have to come out of all the tricks and all the strategies that hell has used to keep us suppressed. Right. That's right. 
That's what suppresses mankind. It's not all the issues that we think are so oppressive. It is the work of an enemy that has figured out how to divide us up, keep us against one another, and keep us with enemies in our life that are designed to be in our own family. We're not going to fall for it anymore. We will not be fooled again. We lived in it, but we're not living in it now. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. We're free. And it takes real revelation for this to really become real for us. We have to be people of revelation, not religion. We have to be people of relationship, not religion. We have to be people with real truth. And while we, I understand there are churches that God's raised up, powerful churches, I'm in them all the time. I love these places, man. These are men and women of God that God's raising up. But you find out that the churches that God is flourishing through are the ones that are getting a hold or have gotten a hold of the very things I'm talking to you about. The days that we're in is, is a new Jesus revolution. I've got uh, a couple of messages on CD. They're downloadable. And by the way, I appreciate the, the mention of our website, DennisBurkMinistries.org. I encourage you to go to it, see all the junk we got. It's, it's, uh, it's some powerful stuff that's going to really help you. A lot of it's downloadable. Uh, I know some of you went for the book that I mentioned that I wrote on how to meditate God's Word. I'm glad you did. Some of you bought it while I was still speaking. What's that all about? But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it, but that's great. But, um, uh, you know, we've run out of some of this stuff, but uh, uh, I encourage you to go get, get some of the other things there also. But uh, I've, I've got a couple of messages where I've talked about the Jesus revolution, gave a lot of what I gave you here today, and then further things uh, that I've come to understand about it. And I want to I really give you a few more of these things not so much just my story and Vicky's story, but really our story together, man. We are in this together. And look, I know you've got your times and your issues and things that you've come out of, every one of you. It's powerful who we are. Amen. It's powerful what we've overcome. It's powerful that we have a passion on the inside of us for Jesus. That's, what, that's, that's our North Star, man. That's what governs us. That's what makes us into today's Jesus freaks. And, you may not like that name. I wear it with pride and uh, in, in, a, in a twisted sort of way. I don't know if pride can even be good, so, you know, you got to qualify everything these days. But, uh, <laughs> but whatever it is, I like, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to it. It's just that Jesus is, is what we're all about. It's not about our look. It's not about our dress. It's not about whether you country or rock and roll. It's about whether you are in Jesus, and that passion is still what's pushing your life and moving your life forward. You see, that's one of the things that distinguished us in those days, and it will continue to distinguish us today. It's not our head knowledge, it's the passion of Jesus that's on the inside of us. And we need the knowledge, don't get me wrong, that's what Peter told us, grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about, but we're also to grow in the grace. That's what Peter said, grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We grow in these things by our fellowship in the presence of God. Certainly by the times we are in the Word, but it's not Bible study only. It's fellowship in His presence. It's worshiping God. It's those times where the anointing washes through you and reminds you of all the great things that God is and all the great things God has done. And all of who you are now that you're in Christ. And, and it reminds you, I, I think of it often, all the, all the trash I've come out of. And some of you have been through a lot more than I have. And I get that, man. We've all got our stories. I keep saying it. But we're out of that now. That's, that's our story, but that's not our complete testimony. Our testimony is not who we were. Our testimony is who we are. That's how we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. It's not all the trash. It's all the deliverance. 
It's all the greatness of God. It's all who we are now that we're in Christ. It's that we are designed by God to rule and reign in Christ Jesus. It's that we've made the decision, man. We are going to live in the victories that Jesus has bought and paid for us to obtain. And we're not going to be denied and we're not going to be talked out of it. And we're sure not going to be embarrassed out of it. We're not going to get offended out of it. We're not going to let the tricks that the devil's used against the church for centuries beat us down. And if we've been beat down, man, then it's time for you to rise back up. Glory to God. Satan's tried to steal from us all along. But if he could beat you, he would have done it before Jesus lived on the inside of you. He would have done it while you were still serving him. He would have done it while you were still under his influence like you were. If he could have, if he could have killed me, he would have. He tried. Motorcycle wreck while I was on acid, that was a, that was a good try. Yeah, that was a wild ride, you know. It was a wild ride. I thought I was taking off, actually. I did. I thought I was taking off. And I thought that right up until the time I realized I was going down. I am not taking off. But he fell off the back. He got broken up pretty bad. I turned out all right. But I just remember the, the one thought I remember while I'm dragging down the highway, hanging onto my bike at 70 miles an hour on the 405 at midnight. All the sparks coming off my motorcycle, I just remember thinking, my goodness, I wish I had my camera. <laughs> How wrecked is that, man? I mean, you are in trouble if that's what comes to your head. Anyway, you don't care. But uh, we're not going to let these tricks of the enemy agitate us, keep us off balance. Maybe your kids are under an influence that's stronger than they are right now. Man, I got a word for you moms and dads. I want you to hear this. I want to read something to you out of Jeremiah. Boy, I didn't intend to go here, but I'm, we're here now. Here's what Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 16 says to you moms and dads. Listen close. Refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. For your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord. And they shall come back. Everybody say, they'll come back. They'll come back. They shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope in your future, says the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own borders. Say it, they're coming back. Whatever enemy's been stronger than them, whether it was drugs, Influence of people, occult, whatever it's been that's been on them. You and me, we stand together for this word to come about in their life. We command deliverance into those children's life, into their soul. We refuse to let them go. We refuse to let them and allow them to remain in the mess that they're in. We call them back and we declare they are the redeemed of the Lord. They come back to their own borders in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Back up to verse 11. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob. But you could put your kid's name in there. And ransomed him or her from the hand of the one stronger than he. Whatever it's been. What you've got stronger. Doesn't matter where they are, where they're incarcerated, where they're lost. Maybe you haven't seen them, talked to them in... Who knows how long? They're still family, man. They still belong. And you still have the right to lay hold on them, stay, keep them in your grip in the name of Jesus. You receive that today? Yes. Glory to God. Woo! Now let me read something else to you from the Bible. Since we're in the Bible, it's probably good we stick with that. Romans chapter 5. I really want to come in for a landing on these days in Romans chapter 5. Mm-mm-mm. You're the kind of people I could talk to for day after day after day after day. I like you. I was fishing for that. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> because this is such a time of transition for all of us, everybody in the body of Christ. And we've got to respond to this. 
But I want to position something for you. And, and again, these are not new ideas. I get that. But I, I want to position something for you about these days and what we are doing, what's happening even here at this school. I'm going to be bold enough and just to go ahead and give you my take on it. But Romans chapter 5, verse 17 says it this way. For if by one man's offense death reigned, and we know who he's talking about there, obviously. He's talking about Adam. Adam's offense, death reigned. He didn't say sin reigned. Sin brought death, we understand that. But sin didn't reign because the law hadn't been given. You can't have sin without the law. Well, we're not going to go down a road, but that was a cool thought. But death reigned through the one, much more, everybody say much more, much more, much more those who receive or those who take or those who seize and make personal the abundance of grace, or as Rotherham says, the superabundance of favor, those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness, everybody say free gift, and receive the free gift of righteousness, they will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. This is the transition that all of us make and that every believer has to solidify in their own life. It doesn't come only by the new birth. It comes also by embracing what has taken place because of the new birth. Let me read this to you also from the Passion Bible. I'm going to back up into verse 16 where he said, And this free-flowing gift imparts to us much more than what was given to us through the one who sinned. For because of one transgression, we are all facing a death sentence with a verdict of guilty. But this gracious gift leaves us free from our many failures and brings us into the perfect righteousness of God. Acquitted, where, the, where are the words not guilty? Verse 17, death once held us in its grip, And by the blunder of one man, death reigned as king over humanity. But now, everybody say, but now. But now. Ooh, you got to keep your butt in the right place <laughs> in these things, but you got to realize everything before the butt changes with everything that comes right after the butt. And so, but God changes everything we just read that happened before. But God, but now much more are we held in the grip, look at this, held in the grip of grace. Oh, I love that statement. You are held in the grip of God's grace. And you continue reigning as kings in life. Enjoying, listen, listen to this, but I love these words. Enjoying the regal freedom through the gift of perfect righteousness in the one and only Jesus, the Messiah. Held in the grip of grace, free to live in that regal and even royal gift of righteousness that's been given to you by simple faith in what Jesus did. Our life and really the capacity to literally rule and reign the way he describes it. We like to say it. It hinges on revelation of the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness. Those are the issues. This is what Paul really makes clear throughout everything. The thing that keeps you free from the drug life and keeps you free from the tobacco and gets you and then keeps you free from the pornography and the anger issues that you've dealt with and the violations that betrayed your life and the betrayals that you've suffered with. The thing that makes you free and keeps you free is a revelation of those two things. The abundance of grace and then the free gift of righteousness that defines who you are today. 
You're not an old sinner anymore. A lot of times you hear people say it, and I get it. I know what they mean. Well, we're all just old sinners saved by grace. But the truth of it is, you one or the other. You're either the old sinner or you're saved by grace. You get saved by grace, you're not that old person anymore. That old sinner, thank God, is dead. That old stoner is dead. That old anger person is dead. That old betrayed person is dead. That old pain is dead. It has no right to remain because you've been made free in Jesus. Glory to God. Reign as kings in life by the one Christ Jesus. Glory to God. Sadly, you find a lot of Christians are not really reigning all that much. And that's why you and me as believers, we have to not only take it personal, we have to make it a part of what we minister to people. We've got to help people. They've got to come out of, the, of all the, the fear they have. We've got to help people come out of the fear of their future based on the failures of their past. we got to help people come out of what sin has done to them and try to convince them about their life and their future that God's got a better plan for them. we got to help people just connect. And not everybody will take the help. I know that. But man, we get, we get to give it to them. There's a deposit on the inside of you that's bigger than the fear and the anger issues and the demonic issues that have held people captive there's something bigger on the inside of you and you know it's there it's the light of God the devil knows it's there the devil can see these things sees how powerful you really are and does his best to keep you derailed over onto other issues so that you never activate and really stand in that place of power where you've where you've been delivered to are you with me in this that's the trick the enemy plays that's the game if he can bring fear into your life, discouragement. If he can use the battles on the outside to bring fear on the inside, to keep you disconnected from where God really wants you, then he has you in a place. He can't drag your soul to hell. It's too late for the devil to take you to hell. Is that true for you? Yeah, yeah that's true. It's too late. He doesn't have me anymore. But if he can, if he can paralyze me with the issues in life, the attacks, the battles, if he can paralyze me with the fear or the offense or the betrayals or the anger issues that come up, if I can get paralyzed by those things, then he's done his best. And instead of dragging me to hell, I'm going to heaven. There's no question about it. But I'm not going to have the kind of impact on people that I'm designed to have. My friend, you've been designed to carry this anointing and, uh, and to deliver other people. That's picking up the mantle, my friend. That's preparing people for this kingdom in the days that we're in. And it comes with the word of our own testimony. It comes with the life of God that's in us. It comes with that love that God really did all of this through. It was all about his love reaching out to you and me that drug us out and got us out of all the mess that we were in. We know those things. We have to be the kind of people that'll just go ahead and get out of our comfort zone and let the love happen. Let the words encourage not to judge people for their failings and what they've done wrong, but to be a voice that even sows a seed. And sometimes you never even see that seed grow. You just plant it. And you plant it right and God will work on it. Glory to God. I had an experience. I'll, I'll probably come to a close on this one somewhere. But I had an experience a number of years ago that really brought this to light. How much not only is in us, and I knew that. I've been walking in a long time but how it's really recognized by people when they don't even realize what they're seeing. I was on a flight. I was on my way to minister in Australia. I go to Australia every year. And I've been all over that country, a lot of different places, beautiful place, and, and it's been a delight. But I was on one of these really long flights. Any flight to get to Australia from here is going to include a long flight. And I was on this long flight, and I was on that big Airbus 380, that great big two-story airplane. And I'm going to be here for three days, it feels like. I'm going to be here for a long, long time. Not really that long. It was about 17 hours, but that just is a long time. And so at one point, <clears throat> several points really, I, I go on little walks. You know, you take little walks. You've got a lot of room to walk. 
I'd walk through different cabins and different places, and, you know, people are sleeping, and they're all out and knocked out and stuff, which is the best way to travel. And, uh, and so I got back to the, the way in the back on this airplane. They had a galley set up. There's a staircase goes upstairs and a galley where they've got some snacks and foods they expect you to steal. And, uh, you know, a couple of restrooms and then some room there. Just, uh, and there was just two people there. There was a fellow standing over in the corner and kind of stretching. And I went back there to do a little stretching and just stand a while. And, but there was this, this other lady. There was this lady there. Kind of a little wiry thing, you know. And she, uh, she was exercising. She was taking exercise to a new level for travel. It was, it was like wild, man. And I, I stood there and watched her. I got winded just watching. And uh, she was doing jumping jacks. And she got down and gave, gave it 20. And uh, she was doing stretching and she was doing stuff that you just didn't think you should do with your body. And it was kind of strange. And I'm, but I'm watching, you know, and it was entertaining. And uh, I didn't want to participate, frankly. It just didn't really do it for me, but she was in it. In a little bit, she stops, catches her wind, and we're all just standing around, you know. And we, She strikes up, just says hello. I said hello back to her, and I noticed she had this distinct Russian accent. So I pulled out a little Russian. I know very little. I mean, like, very little. But you pull out what you can. You try to impress everybody you possibly can. Image is everything. <laughs> so I said, Dobre utra, which I think is good afternoon. <laughs> or is it good morning? Okay, now I'm in trouble. She says, oh, you know Russian. I said, yeah, that was it. That's all I know. <laughs> but I've been to Russia. I said, I've been to Russia a few times. And she, oh, she thought that was, my, oh, yes, you've been to Russia. Oh, I grew up in Russia. I grew up in a small village. And she began to tell me a little bit about her little village. And she said, uh, when I grew up in Russia, I grew up, uh, and, and as I grew up, I realized that I had a special gift. And I had a special gift to see things in people. And over a period of time, people would come to me in our village, and they would come to me to help them. I could see into them and see a, a disease in a part of their body. I could see their energy level. Well, I know what, I'm, I know what this all means. She's a soothsayer, seer type, very demonic. But I didn't see any reason to cut it right off. This was a long flight. So I let her roll for a while. And she said, she said to me, I know, you don't judge. Please, don't judge. She says to me, and, and I see, ooh, and she got very dramatic. I mean, I can't even do what she did. It was wild. She said, ooh, I see, I see your energy. I've never seen such energy. This is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Your energy in you. And I thought, hey, lady, you're the one doing all the push-ups. It wasn't me. You know. <laughs> no, she isn't talking about that. She was seeing something she had never seen before. She said, I see your energy. And, ooh, it's so pure. It's so white. It's such pure. And the guy over in the corner, he's like, <laughs> what? That energy is so pure. It's so white. I've never seen such pure white energy. And then she says this. She said, I see, see your life. I'm seeing something in your life. Did your father die when you were young? Okay, now this is shifting. I said, yeah, he actually did. Did he die in 1971? I said, no, no, he died in 1967. But I said, I know what you're seeing. Yes. And I know what you're getting. And, and they love this stuff, you know. 
I said, and this is amazing. They just love that. This is amazing what you've seen because you're right. I know what this energy is that you see. And I know it's like nothing, lady, you have ever seen. And I know that it's pure. And I know that it's white. And I know that it came into my life in 1971. I said, so you're seeing something. It's very real. It's very pure. It's very powerful. And lady, it's what you've been looking for your entire life. And she's like, her eyes are huge. And she's short. She's looking up at me. And I said, lady, it was in 1971 that I discovered that Jesus Christ is real and would free me from every trick and everything that Satan had done to destroy my life. And I said, that's the energy that's in me. It is the power of the Holy Spirit that came to me when I made Jesus the Lord of my life. And the same power is available right now to you also. Now she glazed over. And she began to talk. And she began to take this somewhere else. And I knew we were in a, in a moment that... She has to make a decision. I can't control what's going to happen to her. I can't control the decision that she's going to make right now. But I've put words in her that she will never be able to escape. Seeds that are in her that are alive, they're spiritually alive, injected into her soul. Satan cannot pry them out. And while she glazed over and instantly wanted to leave and she turned and left I didn't get a chance to do anything further and boy you want to there's so many things you can do you feel like you want to do you look back and wish you had done but here's what I know I know that she came in contact with the pure with the powerful with the right anointing of the Holy Spirit that comes only through Jesus Christ and she will never be the same. I will see this lady in heaven and we're going to laugh and shout and talk Russian together. In Jesus' name. Glory to God. And what I want you to see is that that's not in me because I am in the ministry. That is in me because I know Jesus. Because he came into my life in 1971. He brought his delivering power. He offered me a mantle to pick up, a mantle of the Holy Spirit that would deliver my soul, that would deliver my body, that would bring my mind and my emotions into a place of receiving the impact of this pure white energy. And I believe in the, the last couple of minutes, and I have just a short time. The bell's going to ring right in the middle of this, but I want you to hold steady a moment longer. Because I believe the Holy Spirit wants to do something in many of you right here in this audience. I didn't really know the Holy Spirit would let me go this direction, but in the next couple of moments, God is going to reach into your soul. And you know the difference between spirit and soul. I know you're born again. I know that you've been made right and righteous in Christ. But these things have to affect your habits, your thinking, your emotions. That's your soul. And what Satan has done in many people's lives is injected what I've come to understand as a thorn in the soul of a person's life. Paul talked about the thorn in the flesh. When the Holy Spirit helped me understand this, and I saw the thorn can also be in the soul. And any time, even though we feel free from so many things, as long as that remains, any time Satan chooses, he flicks that thorn and it feels like it's brand new. That all the pain is still there, all of the heartache, all of the betrayal, all of the anger, it just remains because it's in your soul. And Satan will continue to flick that and keep you off balance for what has gone on in your heart, in your innermost being. 
And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to do something supernatural in you right now. Some of you need this to happen in your soul where the Holy Spirit reaches in and pulls this thorn out. It's really just as miraculous as a divine healing in your body. And it can have an instant and permanent effect. I know because I've watched this happen in my own life. And I believe the Holy Spirit wants to do that in some people right now. You've been plagued by whatever it is. Maybe for decades, for years, something that was done, something that was said, something that you failed to do or something that you did that you regret. All, all different things that happen, that Satan has left his mark in your soul. And the Holy Spirit wants to help you right now so that that thorn is just pulled out. It has no right to remain. So all over this room, I want you just to close yourself off to the Holy Spirit. Some of you that need this exact thing, and you know what I'm talking about, I want you to lift a hand right before God. Holy Spirit, here we are. We're at the throne of God. We're in the presence in the altar place. And I stand before these men and women and in the authority of Jesus. I'm asking you now to do just what you do, just what I've watched you do time and time again, Lord. I'm I release that power of the Spirit of God to reach into the soul of these men and women and to, and to pluck that thorn out. That thorn of betrayal, that thorn of heartache, that thorn of offense, that thorn of drug addiction, that thorn of pornography, that thorn that has remained and violated their soul. That in the name of Jesus, this is that moment. That in the authority of Jesus, my brother, my sister, you are made whole. I release that to you now. That the grace of God rise up out of your innermost being and flood through your emotions and through your thinking and through your habits and through your soul to restore and make you, make you whole in Jesus' name. Now say it out loud, I am made whole, made whole. by the blood sacrifice of Jesus. And by the work of the Holy Spirit, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. I am made whole in my soul in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Will you stand up right now? Just stand up. Look, I want to thank each one of you for being a part of this. I know it's, you didn't have a choice, but I did. <laughs> thank you for staying a little long today. I believe it will continue to bear fruit, and I am excited about the next time I get to come back. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I just want to show you this. It's my new Bible. I got one to turn for.